Welcome back to the Strength and Speed Podcast. I'm your host, Evan Preparis, and my co-host hey, is actually here this week, back, Brenna Calvert. Say hi. <laughs> yeah, back on the podcast. If you're hearing a small echo in the background, that is my daughter apparently mimicking everything I'm saying. So, <laughs> say hi. Hi. Yeah, that's her. Okay, uh, before we get to our special guest, this episode is brought to you by Marina Sport. Marina Sport makes medical-grade compression clothing, um, including shorts, pants, calf sleeves. <laughs> Excuse me. <Sorry>. Hey. <laughs> um, I actually wore Marina short compression pants underneath my wetsuit at World's Toughest Mudder this past weekend. And I can tell you after wearing them, Underneath a wetsuit, they are now my go-to compression pants for wetsuit wear. Uh, for the first time ever, I got zero chafing over the course of a 24-hour race, which is pretty huge because normally the chafage is real bad. Brenda, what are your thoughts on Marina? Um, I've been wearing them for about three years now since I started competitive racing, and they're my go-to race pants. I can't think of a race that I've done without them. Um, they help for recovery. I travel in them and they're just all around awesome and they make them in bright red. So I love them even more. Right on. So joining us today on the podcast, we have Margaret Schlachter. I think I said your name right. I should probably know that by now. Uh, she's the owner of Dirt in Your Skirt. She's the editor in chief of Mud Run Guide. So I guess technically my boss and she is the first pro OCR athlete. So Margaret, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, yeah, Schlachter, close, yeah, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I know how to say it, and then like when it's time to say it on air, I start panicking and then like second guessing myself. Do you ever get that? <laughs> yeah, I do the same with your last name sometimes. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's pretty normal. There's, there's lots, there's lots of lots of P's and R's, you know, in, in your last name. <laughs> yeah, I get a lot of uh, papyrus or purpers is, is pretty normal for me. So I'm fairly used to it by now. Anyway, Margaret. Hey, you got to yeah. say first name. That's the important stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Anyway, Margaret, if you don't know who she is, you're probably not paying attention much in the OCR world because she's pretty much everywhere. Um, anytime you're watching one of those Mud Run Guide live feeds covering events from race days, she's typically behind the camera. Uh, if you were at OCR World Championships or US OCRC, she was running around with a gimbal and a camera on it, again, filming all the action, keeping everyone updated. Now, she's been all over the OCR world for so long, there's so much to cover, but I think we're going to try to do something a little bit different. Um, besides focusing on, you know, she has her own podcast, Dirt in Your Skirt, and then plus all the stuff she does from Mud Run Guide, we kind of want to talk about some of her early competitive career, uh, kind of why she retired and just kind of pick her brain on where the sport's going. So, yeah, sure thing. <laughs> yeah. I always find like the early history of OCR, you know, it's only a couple years old, pretty interesting. Um, because I got involved in 2014 and, you know, I missed those first couple years. So wasn't 100% tracking what was going on. So let's start off, Margaret. Just tell us about your early uh, career in OCR and kind of how that got started and where it took you. Sure thing, yeah. I, I guess the first time that I was ever, and I realized this after the fact, like a couple of years in obstacle racing, like where I first saw obstacle racing, and Discovery Channel did a special, I don't know what it was called, I don't know what it was about, but it had Tough Guy in it, and um, that was a few years before, I would say it's going to be like, I'm guessing, like 2007 maybe or so, they had a little piece on it, somebody was there, something, I saw it, I was watching it with my parents, and I'm like, oh, that looks interesting, and um, then I just totally shelved it, like, it wasn't something I saw ever again, really, um, but then I had a series of life events sort of happen that I changed jobs, changed where I was living, and ended up in Killington, Vermont, and one of the women who... I was on the volunteer fire department as an EMT, and 
because, you know, when you have a couple months off, why not just become an EMT, move to a new town, and join their volunteer fire department? Uh, but one of the women liked this thing called Spartan Race back in 2009. And I was like, oh, I'm kind of like I looked it up, and I'm like, oh, that looks interesting. Cool. Yeah, I'll go try it. It's never happened before. Uh, so I signed up for the first Spartan Race I ever had, which is outside of Burlington, Vermont, back in spring 2010. And it was absolutely nothing like what you see today. Uh, there were no burpees. It was push-ups. Uh, there was a gladiator. It was not at the finish line. It was in hidden in the middle of the woods. <laughs> so as you kind of pushed through all these pine trees, um, that you all you heard is whack, whack. <laughs> and you ran through. And then all of a sudden there's this big burly dude who was actually a farmhand. Uh, on Joe's farm, dressed as a Spartan, hitting you with those uh, with those pugil Pugil sticks. sticks. Yeah, yeah, and um, that was back. They did have a slip wall. It was had dish soap all over it, like they used to in the early days of Spartan Race. Put dish soap on the slip wall, so they were actually slippery, like really slippery. And yeah, the spear throw was not into a spearman. It was into a painted circle. They'd used a hula hoop to paint a circle uh, in the ground, and you had to get the spear to land in the circle. <laughs> so, it was, so it was like a javelin or instead? Yeah, like it was a... more like a javelin throw back then, like get it into the circle. Uh, when I signed up for a two-mile race, I got there, and they said, oh, we actually changed it. It's now two laps on our course, so it was a four-mile race. <laughs> And back then there was no competitive heat. It was if you finished well in the heat in the beginning of the day, which more than just Spartan did this for like uh, in the early, early days, um, which is funny because it's like eight years ago. But um, you, if you finished high enough in your heat throughout the day, they had like a championship heat at the end of the day where then you ran the course all over again, just one lap this time. Um, so that was the first Spartan race that ever took place. I mean, one of the obstacles was crawling under a tarp. That was an obstacle. <laughs> <laughs> so it, the, the industry has progressed a lot, but I, so I did the first race and I just did it as like a whatever. Um, I just wanted to do something different. Um, I was out of college. I played two sports in college and now I was coaching sports, but wasn't really doing anything for myself. And it's really easy for any college athletes once you're not, a college athlete anymore not training consistently and uh for me it was i went to a high school for athletes as well so i'd spent the last eight plus years like basically on a training regimen for uh you know all year long and then i was a well, about five years out of college and i was like oh i'm pretty out of shape right now and so yeah so i found spark i I found Spartan Race first and then did a Warrior Dash that year, did the famous Spartan Race in Amesbury where they flew the banner that says, if you think this is tough, come do a Tough Mudder. Uh, so I actually watched that banner fly over and then signed up for a Tough Mudder. That, I knew about Tough Mudder, but it kind of that put the um, – I guess that kind of planted the seed for Tough Mudder in my brain. And then sometime in the early winter, 2010, it wasn't 2011 yet – I signed up for uh, Tough Mudder at Mount Snow, Vermont, and I said, okay, I'll try that. I've never run a 10-mile race before. I've never run 10 miles in my life before, actually, because I was not a runner. I was a lacrosse goalie and an alpine ski racer growing up. Like, I played goalie for lacrosse so you didn't have to run. Like, not <laughs> a runner, slowest person on the team, definitely, like, was all quick and anaerobic that was my base so all of a sudden to find myself in an endurance sport is a very different <laughs> world but yeah so did, so did the tough mutter didn't really understand the tough, tough mutter ethos at the time and thought it was a race so i ran it like a race crossed the finish line uh so this is now single to mile weekend 2011 crossed the finish line and they said you've qualified for world's toughest mutter and this is before they'd had a world's toughest mutter. And I was kind of like, okay, I, I kind of knew what it was, but I'm like, what's that? And they're like, it's a 24 hour race. We get to do, get to do a tough mutter like for 24 hours. I'm like, oh, well, that sounds awful. <laughs> but they offered a <laughs> discount of like, I think the race back then was like less than $400. And they offered something like a $100 discount if you signed up within the first 
um, week of doing the Tough Mudder. And it was weird because it was like you had to qualify that year, but you self-submitted a time. And then I know of nobody that didn't qualify. So, <laughs> like, it, 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 they said it was a qualification. You felt like you qualified for something, and then every single person got in. So <laughs> I don't know that there was any qualification. But, um, but I, I, I don't know. Something within me was like, oh, I'll sign up for a 24-hour race for sure. Why not? Like, cool. I still don't know why I pulled the trigger on that one. But um, through that, I was like, okay, well, you can, like, fake your way through a 5K obstacle race. You can fake your way through a 10-mile obstacle race. And by fake, I mean you can walk, you can crawl, you you can get yourself across the finish line. It might be more painful if you're out of shape than if you're in shape, but you can't fake 24 hours of racing. So quickly consulted with some friends. I was coaching skiing and lacrosse at the time. So, um, and had a background and knew what it takes to train for something. So I reached out to a local climbing gym and started to work out with the owner. He created this like crazy workout program in Rutland, uh, Vermont. And I went and worked out with him once a week. And then I got myself on a endurance running program that I found online through like ultra ladies. I think it was something like that. And I said, I need something to hold me accountable to do this training and something. So I decided to start a random blog that would track my training. And that was called dirt in your skirt. And that's how Dirt Your Skirt got started, was just to track my training for um, the first World's Toughest Mudder. And then, obviously, it's turned into a lot more than that now. But in the beginning, it was like I would – I started the, the blog in spring 2011, so it was already a year um, into this industry. And it would be like, today I'm going to go for a run. And then I would – like, I'd put it on the Facebook page, and then I'd go for the run. And then I would – write an article about that run and put like the map my run or whatever Nike plus app or whatever I was using at that time um, embedded into it. So um, that was, that was kind of the genesis of it all. And then I would get like a new pair of shoes and write about the shoes. And there just was pretty much nobody else doing that when I was, when I started in 2011. So kind of was at the right place at the right time. And now I think I've written, I think I did a math the other day. It's something like I've written over 2000 articles in just about obstacle racing in the last seven years or more. Now I think it's over 2000 now. It's something ridiculous. <laughs> that's yeah, I mean, crazy to hear the, well, I was going to say it's crazy to hear because like from someone that's been in it since I guess to 2013 to like hear how, it's different now, like the gladiators. Most people, if you're starting now or listening to this podcast now because it's a newer podcast, probably don't even know what the gladiators are anymore from Spartan because I feel like that's been gone for a couple seasons now. So it's just funny to, like, hear how it was and so, like, old school almost, but it's not even an old sport. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I mean, like, when I think about all the different races that have kind of come and gone um, that have – seen and I, I've joked around before with the the guys at Mud Run Guide so I'm a huge fan of obviously I went to high school in Vermont so um, Ben and Jerry's is like an institution and Ben and Jerry's on their website has a graveyard of flavors and it puts the flavor like the dates that it was around and then like what a description of what the flavor was I, I was like I, I kind of want on on the Mud Run Guide website and I've kind of been told this is probably not the best thing to have, but I want like a graveyard of races. I mean, that's like the races that have come and gone. Like some have been amazing and have left for various reasons. Um, some have stuck around and, uh, but just kind of somewhere that's like this race was from this year to this year and these are what they did. And then like, like a little blurb about it. <laughs> and, a positive note and make it like the history and story of OCR, not like a graveyard of dead races. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want it to be animated and to be like really, really interactive and, and fun. And maybe like a, a superhero would like blow up in your face, like rise out of the grave for some of scramble. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know I've seen, there's a video, I'm going to see if I can find it, of is Hobie Call doing one of the very early Spartan races. And it is, like, horrifying to watch compared to, like, what the product is now. Um, it's pretty much just as you described it. You know, like, he's, like, running around and, like, the course isn't really well marked. It's, like, through a field. 
and the volunteers are like telling him things and he's he seems confused at some of the obstacles but it's it's really amazing how far the sport has come in a couple of years like you watch that initial video and you know looking back on it now i'm like how did we ever get off the ground like this is horrifying like this looks <laughs> not professional at all i mean it just looks like it looks like something you'd set up in your backyard with like minimal planning it's unbelievable so it, I mean, it really is, and it's amazing that uh, to just see all of the different companies as they've kind of grown and changed, especially I feel like it's been on hyperdrive in the last year or so, year, really two years now. Like it, when I look back to things that happened like 2010, 11, and 12, and to then look at like 16 and 17 – it's two completely different industries almost now at this point because it's it's like what was going on in 2011 and 12 it was it was great i mean somebody had to be there first and and we had to start somewhere i've had this conversation a bunch of times with or i've had this conversation before so i went to high school with um ross powers who was the first olympic medalist in snowboarding um in the i think it was the Nagano was the first one with snowboarding, I think. I can't remember off the top of my head right now. But anyways, he won the gold in that Olympics, uh, which everyone was the first snowboard one. And, you know, Ross and I were chatting one time, and he was like, you know, when what got me to the Olympics and what I won an Olympic medal doing, the sport has progressed, that sport has progressed so much. He's like, I wouldn't even podium at like a local competition now with what won me a gold medal, you know, not not too many years ago, like 20 years ago or so. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that in obstacle racing too um, because it's like the caliber of athletes just continues to elevate and the fact that this industry has been around long enough that someone in their early 20s could have started this potentially when they were in their late teens or something like that. So, I, you know, I'm really amazed to see what happens in another, like, five-plus years when, like, the young teenagers now have literally, like, when I watch them at, like, the U.S. champs or at um, the OSR World Champs or any event that kind of caters to all ages, is that you see this – I'm like, I wonder how good they're going to be when they're, like, 28 years old if they started it at 18 and they still continue to do it the whole time, you know, as well. So, um, I mean, where those of us that were on the top, like in the beginning, there aren't many that, that, that are still at the top, like, um, today. And those that are, I mean, it's even more of testament to their athleticism because, um, to be able to stay up and stay on the top as the sport just continues to progress and the, all the athletes just continue to evolve. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I know a couple of, maybe it was a couple of months ago, you or someone posted a picture of, it was an advertisement for an upcoming Spartan race, and it had, like, you on there, plus a, bother, like a, bother, a bunch of other female athletes, and it was like, you know, who's going to win the race? And I only recognized, like, two names on there. And it was, like, you and someone else. I can't even remember who the other person was. But it was just, it was interesting to see how many, how many people have come and gone in such a short period of time. So. Yeah, I think I think you're referring to Palmerton 2012. Yep. I think it's probably that one. And that was a super cool race, I thought, for, because it was, as far as I know, the only Spartan race that they set the women off first. The women went off about 15 or 20 minutes before the men went off. And the really unique thing was um, that – so Hobie won that race – and Claude Gabut, she finished, uh, she won that race on the women's side. And they crossed the finish line within a minute or two of each other. So it was really cool. You had like the first place male come in and the first place female come in within a minute of each other, which doesn't get to happen the way that the races are run today. That is different. Well, so speaking of like the first known athletes and everything, talking about you being the first pro OCR athlete. When did you like first hear that or be called, you know, like the first competitive pro fem like athlete? Do you remember when it was or what sparked that or what event kind of like led to that? Yeah, so um 
I should say, Gaspari Nutrition came on, came in 2011. I started to pick up some sponsors, um, started to work with like Innovate and started to work with uh, CWX I worked with for a number of years and then another handful of companies as well. <laughs> and then in early 2012, Gaspari Nutrition came on and said, we'd like to bring you onto our team, our pro team, you know, but we have... And it was myself and a whole bunch of fitness models, male and women, like bodybuilder type people, Ronda Rousey, uh, and myself as the obstacle racer. And, uh, and so it's like, it's like bikini, like, so you look on the website, it's like, there were like MMA guys, bikini and fitness, like the IF, I think it's IFBB, I think that's what it is, the, the fitness yep. competition thing. Yeah. And Margaret, the ops racer. So um, they came on and they said, we want to sponsor you. And I said, okay, okay, great. Um, what does that mean? And they said, oh, well, we're, this is a sponsorship with a salary attached to it. So every month you are going to get paid X amount of money and to be an athlete on our, t- on our team. And um, we're going to send you a whole bunch of product. And that was about it other than like writing a, a little article here or there for them. So it was a, and um, so I was like, okay, well that's super awesome to get paid to do this and pay for some of my travel and, and that sort of thing. It wasn't that much. I can tell you that much. It, it, it wasn't much, but it was enough that um, I was head of admissions and college placement over at Killington mountain school, a ski Academy right on Killington at the time. And I don't know. My job had kind of like reached a boiling point and the website, my dirt in your skirt was starting to do some different things. And I just, I, I couldn't do my job anymore. And like, I just wasn't feeling good about where I was at work wise. So I quit. <laughs> it was the day after it was a uh, fourth of July weekend. I just kind of, I went, I was with my parents. Um, and I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to quit when I go back to work and I have this sponsorship and with it, I'm able to pay my rent, um, you know, live super frugally, but pay my rent and buy food and, um, get some races and stuff. And, um, so they said, Oh, you can just try it, see what happens. And then I think the first time somebody said you're like the first whatever professional obstacle racer or whatnot. So it was kind of when I quit my job uh, at the school and my paycheck was solely relied on a sponsorship deal. That's how I could feed myself and have a roof over my head. That, I think I was on – I may have even been on the ORM podcast where I think Matt may have been the first person. We kind of said it jokingly, I think, back in 2012. It's like, well, so that, I guess that means you're like the first professional in this industry. And I'm like, I guess so. Ha, ha, ha. And then it kind of – and then it, it just kind of stuck. You know, then, like, people were like, yeah, I don't think anybody else is actually out here making a living solely off of, like, racing. Like, the website, what you know, Dirt Your Skirt, I, I – started to sell spear kits later on in 2012 so at first i wasn't selling anything on the website so it was purely the only income i had was from uh gaspari and any other bonus i might get from another um from another company that i was sponsored with and this is before they had cash prizes on podiums at all the races so uh there was no real way to uh support yourself i think it so back then in 2012 if you podiumed uh, at a race, like at a Spartan race on, cause that was the, pretty much the only major competitive series at the time. If you podiumed on a Saturday, you got a helmet for first place and then you got some sort of sword or dagger for second and third place. And I have a ton of, I have a bunch of swords and daggers, like replicas sitting in my garage. Um, at the first, uh, stadium race, you got a baseball bat. So I have a baseball bat that says Fenway on it from podiuming there. And then, um, uh, if you podiumed on a Sunday, Innovate was a sponsor back then as well. And you won a free pair of shoes, which was pretty awesome, actually. Um, yeah, it's almost better than Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Saturday, you won a, a, a replica weapon and Sunday, you won a new pair of shoes. Nice. <laughs> well, so, so pre said, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So going back, I mean, you mentioned kind of like what started your training for, you know, you decided to actually have a training plan for the 24-hour Tough Mudder. 
once you were sponsored and on like the pro team, did you kind of find out what you really needed to do? And like, did you change up your training? Like, did you have a specific coach or training plan you worked with to continue strictly obstacle course racing? Yeah, so um, there was no, like, Spartan pro team or any pro team like that at the time, so I was purely on Gaspari's um, payroll and, uh, and uh, you know, working with just, brand, like, brand sponsors. There was no, like, race company sponsoring people at the time. It wasn't until 2013 that Spartan introduced their first pro team, which uh, I was actually invited to be on, funnily enough, and... Um, the contract, the way it was written with my current sponsors, I sent them a revised contract back, and then they ended up just kind of deciding that that meant I didn't want to be on the team. So, oh. uh, so, uh, so yeah, so I, I was sent a contract for the, to be on that first Spartan Pro team, but um, I made some changes to it and then kind of didn't hear back, but whatever. Do you remember who uh, what the names were on, uh, that were on the team by any chance, um, just out of curiosity? Yeah, so um, Andy Hardy for women, Corinne Colon, Corinne Colon was on the team that year. Um, um, Ange Reynolds, I think, was on the team that year. I'm trying to think. I, 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 I've got. I'm like blanking on the names right now. I'd have to. David Magida. I okay. think is, is Hunter. I recognize. Yeah, um, okay, um, I recognize Andy and David. That's it. <laughs> yeah, so it was different. It was kind of based off of the 2012 points series, um, pretty much. Oh, Leslie St. Louis. That's the name that I was trying to think of as well. She's one of the founders of Colorado Obstacle Racers. Uh, she was on the team too that back then. Um, but yeah, yeah, I can't. I'm trying to think. Uh, Rosemary Jury, I think, was on the team as well that year. Um, but yeah, most of those people are n- not racing at a high level anymore. Um, so <laughs> Chris Rutz was on the team. I do know that for sure. Um, and do you ever have those like what if moments? How would it have been different these days if you had been on the Spartan Pro team originally? <laughs> yeah, you know, I thought about it, and then I'm just kind of like, yeah. I think everything. What I've realized in this industry is everything happens for a reason, and mm-hmm. um, I think that's what I've learned in the last eight years in this industry is that <laughs> is that everything happens for a reason like the day after I quit my job uh, at Killington Mountain School I got an email out of the blue that said do you want to turn your website what you're doing on your website into a book and they wanted it to be like a book for beginners know nothing about the industry pick it up at the airport and um, like learn about what the industry is so and you have three months to write it. Um, but, but I mean, so, like, that's that's one of the things. And it's, like, right around when one door can kind of ends up closing in this industry, for me, it's, like, a new opportunity pretty much comes up around the exact same amount of time. So it's, like, when um, – I'm trying to think. It's, like, when Mud and Obstacle Magazine, which I used to write for, when they were around um, – when that was kind of getting towards the end of it, that's about the time when I started to work for Mud Run Guide. It's um, when my Gaspari Nutrition um, sponsorship kind of was up. That's about the time that About.com came in and said, uh, we want you to be our expert for the obstacle and extreme racing part of our website. So so it's kind of I've had a lot of moments like that throughout the years where it's, it's like one kind of – chapters coming to an end and then there kind of always seems to be something around the corner that that happens and i've kind of just put put my faith in the universe these days but i don't think i answered your question so i think i just totally went off topic and i apologize (laughs) it's all good that's what this is for (laughs) but yeah no i was just curious like what did you do because i I only, I think I heard your name once, right, when you might have still been kind of competing, and this was when I was getting into it, so, like, for someone that's not competing anymore, what did you do training-wise back then, because I'm sure now, like, training is just crazy for athletes, so. Right, right, okay, yeah, so, um, when a lot of 2000, well, 2011 and a lot of 2012, I was working full-time, so, um, and then... Then when I started to train full-time, it didn't change that much because 
I was actually training Chris Davis um, and at the time as well, who it, it, people can just Google Chris Davis and Spartan Race and you can kind of see what who Chris Davis is. Anyways, he came on and it was basically like Spartan held their own biggest loser. But in training wise, so um, back in 11 and early 12, I was training about 20 hours a week working a full-time job. Now, I also lived at the school that I worked at. Um, it was an old hotel converted into a boarding school. So my room that I lived in, which was an old hotel room, um, was right next to the gym. Literally, there was my bedroom, the staircase, and then you went into what was our gym at the school. And uh, then, sorry, guys. Um, And then, so I went into the gym, and uh, I would do strength training, Two days a week, I would go work out with my um, with my trainer at the rock climbing gym where we did all sorts of weird stuff, but it was awesome. Like sometimes I'd be flipping telephone poles. Um, other times I would be carrying cinder blocks um, and then stacking them and doing dips and push-ups off of cinder blocks and um, a lot of bouldering, sometimes climbing without using my feet on hold, sometimes climbing without using my hands and just using my feet, a whole bunch of different things we we did. And um, uh, Steve, who owned the place, he had always wanted to create this thing where he took his military background and then took his rock climbing, his passion, and combined kind of the two to make these crazy workouts and he had had it in his head for about 20 years to create these workouts. And I just happened to be the first person that walked in and was like, yeah, let's do it all. <laughs> let's do whatever you want. So so, so that was like three days a week. And then I was running, run slash hiking. Because I had, like I said, no endurance base, no endurance sports base. So I used kind of a, a basic program of running for to try to get uh, up to a 50 mile or like <laughs> six months later. And, um, yeah, so I would run slash hike on Killington Mountain almost every day. Um, a lot of it would be I would hike up and then kind of jog down. Um, and then I, sometimes I'd put, like, a five-pound weight in my my backpack that I would carry with me. Um, then as it kind of got more base built off, I would jog a little bit more. But it was always on the mountain, so I always did trail – like, it was pretty much just – on the ski slopes, some road stuff, but most of the time it was just on on trail, just running. But it ended up being about 20 hours a week I was training. And then when I, then honestly, when I when I just started training full time and racing, it was almost harder to stay on a schedule. And I've heard this from a couple other people before that it's almost harder to stay on a workout schedule when you don't have that when you have all the free time. But um, it stayed pretty much the same. My training, I also trained in 11 and pretty much all of 12 um jason jack sedic who writes like the workouts of the day for spartan race he and i were training partners and we also trained at, with joe DeSena. he joined us about two or three days a week on morning runs and stuff so i used to train with joe a bunch so mm-hmm. all those stories is kind of told in his book and whatnot i heard almost all of them on the mountain at, normally at 4 a.m. because he likes to work out before his kids are awake, which is something that I really appreciate about about him and getting to know him differently than most people do. But um, he works out before his kids get, get up. So that meant we would work out from, like, get up at 4, work out from 4.30 to, like, 7.30, and then go about our days, like, go to work and stuff. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of what my workout my workout didn't really change all that much these days. Now that I don't really race anymore, which now I just if I do a race, if I jump into a course, it's just for fun. I, you know, when I first moved to Utah, I was still racing full time and I was doing CrossFit like five days a week, pretty much when I moved here. And then I'd go run. I would do a second workout in the afternoon and go run and then right in between the two workouts. Um, now, yeah, now I've got. I'm going to ski all winter now that it's just about winter and just started taking like a uh, uh, silk and pole and a whole bunch of other weird like yeah, classes that are totally out of my wheelhouse and totally hard in a new way. That's awesome. I mean, I'm jealous of that, but you, I mean, talking to you now, like we've heard 
I mean, I've heard of all the other guys and Hobie, like the OGs, of, but like you're the OG female obstacle course racer. This is pretty awesome. <laughs> so speaking of now that you're like retired, I guess, quote unquote, when when did you officially retire from competitive racing and kind of like why? What was going on or what made that yeah. change happen? Yeah, for sure. So 2013, end of the year, um, I went down to San Diego to do um, – Alpha Warrior, which is a super cool race. I might come back again. I don't know. Like, it's something, it's one of those events that I keep hearing, like, it's going to come back again. And, like, it came back, and I think it did one this year. Um, but it had an obstacle on it that was uh, – it's very Ninja Warrior-esque, some of their obstacles. But one was this, like, trampoline thing where you jump down onto the trampoline and then you jumped up like four feet onto a platform. Then another was like five feet. And the last one was like five or six feet. I can't remember. Um, so I went to double jump to get up to the top of the last one. And I jumped up and I came down to get that double jump to get that extra spring. When I came down, my left ankle went pop, pop in it. And, um, and right away I knew that I had pretty, severely injured myself um I couldn't stand on it and I tried like I I got myself out of the obstacle and I tried to keep going and then I was like nope not gonna happen (laughs) and then uh got to like kind of had some friends there we like wrapped it up I wrapped it up in like KT tape or something like that and just to kind of keep it compressed I hopped back to my car and drove 12 hours straight, and I have a manual, not an automatic. So (laughs) luckily, I-15 runs from, like, San Diego all the way back to Utah, Um, but it's a 12-hour drive that I had to do on an ankle that was just continuing to swell. So I got home and and got off of it for a couple days. I'm like, oh, I'll just let it, and then I'll go to the doctor. Like, if it doesn't get better, I'll go to the doctor. So a week later, I couldn't, I couldn't stand on it. I was on crutches, and I, I could not put any pressure down. I went to the hospital, or I went to the doctors, and um, I, I was like, I was like, please be broken, please be broken, please be broken, because if it's broken, at least it'll fit, it'll heal. Um, and I get in there, and the doctor says, you have sprained your ankle not only have you sprained the outside, but you've also sprained the inside. And there's, I didn't know a lot about sprained angles before this, but there's one to three is like the rating system they put on an ankle sprain, three being the worst. The the doctor said you have a two plus sprain on both the inside of your ankle and the outside of your ankle. They're like, this is incredibly rare. They're like, we never see people with, having sprained both the inside and the outside at the same time. And um, so at that point, that was pretty much a soul crusher. Um, It really, it was devastating. I mean, I sat, I've kind of followed and I've had a lot of talks with Amelia Boone in the last like two years about her different injuries. And a lot of the things that she's gone through in the last two years is exactly what I went through in 2013 into 14. And if there's any time, the, that was right when the sport really started to progress too. like faster runners came in, obstacles started to change somewhat. And I quickly saw that like, maybe it was going to be a really uphill battle to try to come back. I did race a few races when I was um, healthy again, I hit a few podiums or whatever, but it, I was still running like 2013 world stuff is mutter. I came back and I raced as a team raced on a team that year and we hit 50 miles as a team it was probably one of the dumbest things I've ever done retrospectively because I was in pain running the entire time. It took me over a year to be able to go for a trail run without any pain in my ankle. And uh, still to this day, the ankle is super weak. Like I just, that injury kind of really just, it sucked. I can't say anything more than like, it just sucked. It, It and uh, the sport had just progressed a lot, too. And at the same time, I was having more and more opportunities writing. And I just didn't see myself able to come back and compete at the same level I had been at before. And um, I just kind of then focused, just started to shift. Like, I had more opportunities to write, to do some coverage and whatnot. And I don't know, just kind of embrace that. And that's kind of been, I've kind of been on that track. So um, I think I wrote like a 
an official, official article, I think in like late 2014, that was like, I'm done racing competitively. But um, I had pretty much been done for a little while. And now this year, I think I ran about four races just for fun. But now I just run for fun. I'm a fun runner now. I run like in the back of the pack and just goof around, and uh, and it's it's kind of liberating to to be able to go at races from a, a different point of view. If I am otherwise, I just run around following you all racing. Like Evan, you ran some stupid amount of miles at World's Toughest Mudder, and I think I ran about twenty to twenty five miles that weekend, um, just covering the race. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh in OCR World Championships week, I did I did some quick calculations and I ran over a hundred miles that week um working on the ra- that race. So <laughs> no bands and medals for those sort of things. <laughs> well the injury absolutely sucks, obviously. Uh but I think as for the OCR world as a whole, we are glad that we got the author and podcast host and editor Margaret Schlachter to join uh, and do full time that. So, yeah, like you said, I think everything happens for a reason, and I think the the OCR world as a whole, um, you you've definitely had more of an impact as an author and you know writer than you will um, as an athlete. So, much appreciated there. Yeah, I appreciate that, and I you know I think one of the other things that maybe puts me in a unique situation with what I do now is that I look at everything from like, what does the athlete want? What does the athlete want to know? Like, what did I want to know? Or like, what did I want to know when I started? Or for um, like, you both are podium athletes on pro teams with working with sponsors, all that sort of thing. Like, to me, I was always, when I was talking with people, they'd always, I'd get a lot of questions like, oh, what do you do? What do you eat? What do you train? That sort of thing. And I'm like, you do know I'm a real person, right? That I, that I like, I get tired. I have a house. I still have to go home and do laundry and stuff like that. So I think <laughs> that's kind of shaped what I've done, at least with like dirt your skirt these days is because I'm like, you know, we're all really complex humans here and obstacle racing is one facet of our being. And for some people, that now has become most of their life. And um, we even have to, like, in our house here, my husband will be like, can we just stop talking about obstacle racing for a couple hours because it can be (laughs) all-consuming. But um, we all have all these other things that we do. And and I realized through racing as well, I mean, how many people do you know at an obstacle race that you see on different weekends but you have absolutely no idea what they do in their quote unquote like normal life away from the course. And you're like, wait, you are, you do what? Wait, you do what? <laughs> and, and I found myself kind of saying that to a lot of people once I found out what they, you know, what they did outside of the race course. And um, so I guess when I kind of moved into the media space versus being the racer space, I've always kind of tried to pull like my own experiences as, as a racer into coverage, whether that's like covering a 24 hour race, whether that's doing an interview with an athlete or it's writing an article or it's editing an article or, you know, I'm like, not everybody knows what SR is. If you just write SR, not everybody knows what, um, CTG is. If you just write CTG in a, uh, recap, like you have to write conquer the gauntlet. You can't (laughs) just write these things. So I guess that's, um, that's the one thing I think I've taken from, you know, starting out as a racer and started out as a weekend warrior to then a pro racer to then um, now on the media side. Well, and that's what I love. Like our podcast, I mean, I'm sure a lot of them are different or the same, but, you know, a lot focused on just the athlete and what they're doing with their athletic career. But I've found from the few guests that we've had on and even like teammates of mine that you hear stories of like how they're a real human and, you know, what their life's like. And she's like, whoa okay, talking to you on the podcast, like, this is crazy. You're actually, you know, you do this, and you have a family, and you have a life outside of OCR because it does become all-consuming. And it's it's not so glamorous, and that's what, like, Evan saying to you how much it's appreciated, everything you do, and from Evan and I both being athletes and then on, like, media side, and especially more Evan that, you know, actually writes and everything, it's really, I think, underappreciated what you do 
And I always want to tell everybody because now after working U.S. champs and OCRWC with you, I mean, you, I think I do build crew and you work probably harder. I mean, you're not like building stuff and, you know, labor hard, but you don't get to have as much fun, in my opinion. (laughs) I'm I'm sure you enjoy what you do and it's fun to produce the stuff for all of us that enjoy it. But like, I miss hanging out with you at championships because I don't think people realize that like from sunup to sundown, you're out there. I mean, covering the build, covering pre-race and athletes and everybody coming in, and then you did the, all the live coverages every night while the rest of us were, you know, maybe having a crew dinner or something or, like, a crew meeting, and it was just like, dang it, Mark's missing all this because she is still providing so much for the sport and community that, like, people don't realize that at all, and that's why I'm sure everybody's like, oh, Margaret's on the camera and how glamorous and cool this is, but <laughs> coming from you and me seeing it, it's like... I mean, it's glamorous, I guess, in a way, and you love it, but, man, like, you you do a lot more than just show the race and, you know, write some articles. Like, it's 24-7 when you're at an event, you're pretty much all consumed by it, and that's awesome, and I'm so glad that you do that for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, thanks. I, you know, I appreciate it. Not many people actually get to see what it's what it's like kind of behind the scenes. I think you've had a glimpse of it. I know I just stayed with – um, the Team Four Eyes crew at World's Toughest Mudder, and they're like, are you done yet? I'm like, no, not yet. I still have some more to do. And they're <laughs> like, um, so you done yet? I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, World's Toughest Mudder, that was a 40-and-a-half-hour work day, and I use day in, in quotes these days. Um, I think the 36-hour Survival Run Canada that I covered, that was a – 50-hour day where I didn't sleep for 50 hours and then did continuous um, work for that whole time. So, so yeah, it's 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 a weird I, – I don't know many people that would want to <laughs> put themselves through that sort of sleep deprivation um, and – and maybe get someone to sit, give you a high five afterwards. I mean, there's no medal. There's no trophy. There's, I mean, I, I guess what I get out of it is the fact that I love being out there. I love showcasing the stories. And um, if nothing else, it's like, in a lot of ways, I feel like I've got, been given a lot in this industry. And I know I wrote a post the other day about this, but I just feel like in my way, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in a way it's kind of, um, my time to be able to give back and to hopefully help grow and prosper this industry. But I feel like in a lot of ways it's like giving back because I would say where I am today is completely, um, you know, that one singular decision to try that first Spartan race set my entire professional and personal life on a different trajectory. Had I known that day, you know, it would have been crazy. You know, if somebody said like, so in like two years, you're going to quit your job and this is what you're going to do full time. be like, "Ah, yeah, right. (laughs) That's so funny. And, um, and now I look back and I'm like, you know, it really, I mean, it's changed my whole life. I, and I, I met my husband through this industry. I met, um, you know, I've met pretty much all my best friends these days through this industry. Um, it's I've started new careers because of this industry. Um, and I say careers because it kind of keeps evolving. But, um, yeah, I mean, I literally – when I, it used to be so cheesy. It's like, obstacle racing changed my life. And now I kind of sit here and I'm like, it really did. It did on every level. <laughs> Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, do you, I mean, because you saw me, I think, like, fall asleep in my chair practically at um, U.S. championships. And do you miss at all the competitive side or have moments of, like, wishing you could jump back if you were training or something, like, jump back in an elite wave? But, nope. Like, I, I've tried to do build and race, and I can't choose. I can't figure out which one I like more. <laughs> nope. I, I, I honestly, I watch, I, I watch you all racing. I give major props. Like, um... <clears throat> you know, I, I was, I had a bib for this past world's toughest mutter and I'm like, oh, I'm going to go out and do a lap. <laughs> and then it got to nighttime when I was going to do a lap and I was like, you know, I'm dry. <laughs> I'm like semi warm. I wasn't warm, but I was semi warm. And no, oh, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't even want to do one lap. Like That was probably the right choice. That was a really wet course. <laughs> 
Like, it was... And I watched... Every obstacle was a water obstacle. They're like, oh, here's another water obstacle. You're like, what the... Yeah, and I watched all you guys coming in, and I watched the faces, and I was like, you know what? (laughs) I'm good. I'm good being dry right now. And, um... With the exception, I, I you know, I watch, I love watching World's Toughest Mudder. I love watching Spartan Race World Champ. I love the OCR World Champ. I love, like, any of the races, just going to them. I don't really have that drive anymore within me to be like, I want to be that person. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of years all through high school and college and then after college pushing myself physically, like, really hard. I've seen my breaking point a lot of times um i've been on the brink and i've gone over the line of what when you should have quit i've i've gone over that line a few times and um like the first world's toughest mutter i should have gone to the hospital in retrospect but um a lot of people are like oh like you don't actually get hypothermia at at the races but you feel like you do you're just really cold well, that first World Toughest Mudder, I made it almost the full 24 hours, um, and I made it to, like, 7 a.m. in the morning, and I, I was hallucinating. I threw out it. Anybody that's been to English Town, there's concrete that they put, like, from the track there, and they put tires over it. And in the middle of the night, I thought that it was water between the tires, and it was an unknown depth. And if I put my foot in between the tires, like I had to stay walking on the tires because if I put my feet in between the tires, I would fall into the dark abyss and never come back out. I mean, that's <laughs> it's it's hilarious. No, it's like literally hilarious. I saw an old crone like woman in the middle of the woods that definitely was not there. I heard gunfire as I was crawling through one of the pits and that I thought I was in World War Two. I don't know why World War Two, but apparently that's what I thought at the time and still is in, still in my head. And um ended up in a med tent with uh, the two other people I was running around the course with. And, you know, I got my – I started shaking uncontrollably when we were inside and it was finally getting warmer. And then uh, I went back to work, and it took me five days to be able to sit inside a building that was heated in a normal temperature without starting to uncontrollably shake at some points during the day because I couldn't control my body temperature. <laughs> and awful, Evan. Are you going through any of that? <laughs> so, so with the uh, with the body temperature control, I'll typically have trouble for. It's normally like mm, six hours to twenty four hours after the event, and then I'm fine. Uh, 2014, it took me until Wednesday. So, what is that? Three or four days, where like you know, I'm I'm sitting in a building and I'm freezing, so I start putting on a sweatshirt, and then like you know, 15 minutes later, I'm sweating. So yeah. I take off the sweatshirt, and then I'm freezing again. I, um, But 2014 was the worst for me. That was my first one, and it was also the, the year of the windstorm. So I think just the wind was just uh, – sucked the body temperature out of me. And um, Well, I, hope, I don't I think I should have gone to the hospital. I definitely <laughs> – I definitely did some damage to my body uh, on the 2014 one. Yeah, but. I figure, I mean, to the, like the fact that it took me five days to be able to control my body, to, like it was easily the next Friday before I started to have body temperature control again, which to me is just insane to think that. But like now I'm like, yeah, that is pushing yourself to your limits and then maybe going a little bit too far in the process. But um, no, so I, I guess now – now it's more about me showcasing what other people are doing, and I push myself now differently like you saw, Brenna, at OCR World Championships. I mean, that was every single ounce of my being went into that that coverage. And um, so that's kind of what I do now. And I do, I've been doing a lot of, you know, self-exploration on the mental side, um, which is way scarier, I think, than because you can physically train your body to do stuff. But when you start digging into your own demons and start trying to, like, work out some of the reasons, like, why do I feel like I always have to succeed at things? Or why do I have to do this? And you dig into all your whys. That is kind of where I'm at in my own personal growth right now. So it's not necessarily something you'd see on a race course, but uh, it's a lot of time spent on the in dealing with all the internal stuff. Um, so, so that's where I'm at currently these days. So that's why I know I have absolutely no, I'm not like, Oh my God, I wish I was racing that, 
I would say if that that might come into my head for about five minutes if I see a cool <laughs> obstacle, and then I'm like, you know what? Nah, I'm good. And half the time, if I'm working at a race, I get to try the obstacle anyways before any of you guys do. Like, I did Le Gaff du Travois a bunch of times before the race actually started. And that oh, my gosh. Fun. I think that's the first time I've heard that actually said, the name, oh. like, the whole name. <laughs> I had to learn. Yeah, I've, just, I've just been calling it Marco's obstacle or the <laughs> Northman obstacle. Oh, or Le Gaff. I, I use I use Le Gaff too sometimes. Yeah, Le Gaff du Travois. And if anybody that speaks French Canadian, um, it's probably like I just butchered it, but that <laughs> is um, the best that I can do. With you my know what it's supposed to be? French speaking or like wood? I don't like. What does that have a, a translation to anything? <laughs> oh yeah, so it's a translation of Le Gaff is the um, is basically the hook that you'd use in logging. And we've got a video up on on Mudder and Guide that um, Marco did after the fact, where he talks about what the the genesis of that obstacle. So uh, it basically has to do with logging back in um, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and the Lagaf, I, I believe, if I'm getting this right, um, it the gaff is the long pole that you would help free log jams from because you would cut all the logs down in the um this is really dorky and i'm sorry everybody listening if you didn't want a history on the the lumber industry but um so logging used to happen during the winter it was easier to pull sleds uh horse-drawn sleds across the frozen ground and you all the wood would be cut down mostly throughout the winter and then it'd be dragged to uh, rivers or to like the tops of rivers and then from there is the spring and when the spring happened the obviously the ice would go out on the lakes and the rivers and they would push all of the logs down the river to the timber mills and um, so there would be log jams that would happen and you'd have to use uh, the gas to um, help get those logs free and get them back moving down the river, which is actually one of the most dangerous jobs in the, in the entire industry. So those guys, they would be like crawling or climbing onto giant tree trunk logs with this really long pole and then trying to free the jams and then hope you didn't get sucked into the water and crushed in between two logs. So that's, uh, I don't know the du roi part. So. That's pretty cool to know, though, because that I mean, <laughs> not, might not be OCR related, but it is because it's the name of an obstacle that everybody couldn't pronounce and didn't, just didn't know what it was. But it makes sense now. <laughs> Good stuff. So we got two more questions I want to get to before you know we run out of time, which we're kind of pushing the limits already. Um, so the first one, you mentioned it earlier, the Mud and Obstacle magazine. So there was a magazine, for those of you who don't know, that came out uh, late – Say 2014 probably was the first issue. Lasted for about six issues. 13 to Uh, late 13. I think it was 13 to 14. Lasted for one year, six inch issues, one issue every other month. They had, and I was a contributing editor with them. So what's what's funny is I actually contacted them. It was like right when I started getting into writing. So I contacted them and offered to like write for them. Uh, and then they essentially folded the next month. Mm. <laughs> so, so obviously that went nowhere. Uh, but I did find Mudrun Guide. So I just wanted to like touch on that. Kind of can you tell us the story behind that and um, you know how that started, what your opinion yeah. on it was, and etc. Yeah, sure. So Active Interest Media, they are a publishing house of magazines. They've got oh gosh, they've got at least fifty magazines. I would say underneath their their banner. Um, Everything from, like, horse industry magazines to sailing to lots of different sports. And um, I forget. It was the Bob Bob Young, I want to say. I might be getting the name wrong. I think it was Bob. He was the um, original editor-in-chief of the magazine and sort of pitched the magazine and got it to to come into existence. And um, they also, oh, Active Interest also puts out The Box, which is the CrossFit magazine. Um, So there was a lot of crossover initially, but they kind of reached out to people who were writing. And so they reached out to myself and said, do you want to write some articles? Would you like to be a contributing editor? editor? Would you like to write articles for us? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I thought it was great. I mean, I think the magazine, it's it's interesting. The magazine industry as a whole is 
what happened was the magazine industry as a whole is totally dependent on advertising revenue. I mean, that's how a magazine happens is by it's not subscriptions. Subscriptions don't pay uh, the production costs and, and whatnot. It is what you see in between the pages. And this industry has always had an, an issue with finding the right advertisers to fit within this market because it's such a weird it really is a weird sport. I mean, I, I even had this conversation recently, but it's very hard to get advertising revenue into this industry because when you get down to the weekend warrior who's never done this race before, you can still show up at an event with a pair of like heads on your shorts you wear to the gym if you go to the gym and a t-shirt. And that's and you can make it through the course. It's going to be a really crappy time the whole time, but you can make it through the course. So um, there just wasn't enough revenue coming in through the advertising dollars. So that's why it folded. And it wasn't due to people not being interested in it. But um, I think a lot of it was it was just maybe too new, maybe too ahead of its time um, that it just didn't didn't work out great. But, I, I mean, I loved it. It was great. They came out here. Uh, the first issue, there was an article I wrote about what to wear for an obstacle race. And uh, what was ironic is I was actually on crutches when they came out here and we did a whole photo shoot and I faked the whole thing. <laughs> so there's a photo of me like climbing a rope out of a water pit. I couldn't walk. I, I like got myself to the edge of the water pit, crawled out and I was handed my crutches and crutched to the next place that we did another shot at. So anywhere my ankle was taped and it was covered up with clothing so you can't see it. But um, I was on crutches and I was pretending to do like, some CrossFit moves. I was pretending to do a whole lot of things without actually being able to walk. <laughs> so that's the that's the behind the scenes part of that. Um, but I I thought it was great. It was a great resource, you know. And uh, I think it had a lot of potential to do a lot of things. And it was a bummer that uh, it only had it only lasted a year. But have you been that's in contact with I mean, anything about? I was going to say, have you heard anything, like, of it trying to happen to something similar again now that it's been a few years? Because I feel I, – I love uh, – I don't know. Like, I love paper, like, magazines and being able to, like, tangibly touch and read something. Like, I um, honestly, not going to lie, like, with so many articles and blogs and reviews coming out online, you know, I read the, like, the post caption and, like, click a picture, but it's so easy to just scan through it. Like, I much – I don't know. I like holding a magazine and seeing pictures and, like, flipping pages. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I think the magazine industry over the next five to ten years, it's just going to continue to shrink. And yeah. it's going to be um, – unless you're kind of a magazine that's been around forever, but I even look at the newsstand, even those ones that have been around forever, they're shrinking kind of in how thick they are. But um, but I, I, I shouldn't speak. We only get – sometimes we get National Geographic here and we get Mother Earth News, which is about farming. So um, I'm maybe not the best person on the magazine industry. <laughs> All I know is that I go to bookstores occasionally at, like, Barnes and & Nobles or Borders, and there's, like, you know, 15 racks of magazines, and there's just, you know, hundreds of magazines on all sorts of topics. And, like, I look at that, and I'm like, why can't OCR have a tangible magazine, you know? But I think uh, that explanation about the uh, sponsors and uh, advertising dollars is is a pretty good answer. So, But I'm just amazed that... I'm amazed that these other magazines can be profitable or at least break even enough to sustain themselves, and OCR is, uh, does not have that power or that you know ability yet. So it's kind of interesting. It's interesting, and I like I said, I don't know what's going to happen with that with that particular part of it. it, it honestly, all parts of news media right now, it, it's a very interesting time. I think for anyone in any sort of media whether it's quote-unquote new media which i would consider more like websites are or you're looking at the old media which is like your newspapers and um your magazines and and that sort of thing and then television and whatnot it's a very interesting time across the board and um i think just in general you look at what's going on and um i don't know i guess i'll just leave it at that it's because it's really journalism 
is becoming a harder and harder industry to make a living in. Uh, writing in general is becoming a harder and harder industry. I mean, even uh, news, because the kind of world we live in has changed so much, and office racing has been in this whole change, too. I mean, when office racing started, uh, it's, a, it's a sport that grew out of social media, and in a lot of ways, it's helping lead the way with the kind of the new media of the fact that look at the Facebook live productions, that it's full television productions now that are happening on Facebook, in Facebook Live. Um, you know, Spartan and Tough Mudder, those guys have full crews out there. It's not just like one person. It's not just like when you see myself at like OCR World Championships or at like at World's Toughest Mudder doing stuff on Mud Run Guide or when I was doing stuff at OCR World Championships, I'm working with myself and like uh, like three or four volunteers basically, and we're what with what we're putting out. Uh, when I watch what Spartan Race is doing or Tough Mudder is doing with their shows. They have crews on the low end of, like, 15 people, on the high end of, like, 30 people um, to try to put out to put out their shows. So it just – and they they have backing real, of, like, CBS or NBC. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, I mean, I heard that Spartan Race for one of their races this year that they put out over Facebook Live and whatnot. They actually rented um, a dedicated satellite feed for the day to try to make sure that they would be able to broadcast, um, which which is amazing when you think about it, that it's all happening on Facebook. Well, and that's what, like, it's exciting, definitely, but it's just crazy. Like you said, every news is basically Facebook and social media now. Like, how many people our age and time still sit and watch, like, daily news? No, you basically check Facebook for your news updates, and it's sad and interesting at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so since we're talking about the future, uh, one more question before we wrap this up. So since you're so involved in the industry, you know, where do you see the future of our sport going? Um, you know, we talk, we talk in Olympics, are we talking uh, just kind of more of the same or, you know, maybe like I know CrossFit has, obviously the CrossFit has their own like CrossFit games, but then there's also something called the, uh, uh, called the Grid League, which mm-hmm. is basically like a you know, a similar yeah. version of CrossFit, but there's like teams. Um, so yeah, just kind of share your opinion on where you think the future of the sport is. Yeah. It's a loaded question. <laughs> I feel <laughs> like, okay. So, um, I, I referenced snowboarding again, because I guess I, when I was in high school, it was right around. And I, after Spartan race in Tahoe, I had breakfast with one of my former classmates who was on track to go to the Olympics, um, for snowboarding as well. And, um, so we were just chatting about the state of obstacle racing versus where snowboarding was in the late nineties. And right now obstacle racing is tracking almost fully parallel with snowboarding. What was going on, even when we get down to different federations that are trying to, who's going to be governing bodies, all that sort of thing. Are we going to get pulled under another sport? Um, are we going to go to the Olympics? Should we not go to the Olympics? What safety regulations should we put, get put in? But if we put safety regulations in, is it going to destroy what makes the industry so awesome? So all of these topics were literally taking place in the late 90s, early 2000s when I was um, – in high school and in kind of mid nineties, it all kind of started when, um, when I was in the, the, I was at the ski, I was, a, I was a skier, but I was at a school with all the people having the conversations about this in the snowboarding industry and some of the top coaches and athletes in the industry. So I kind of had a bird's eye view of watching it all unfold and we're tracking the exact same way right now. I still think that I think if obstacles and goes to the Olympics one day, great. You know, I'll leave it at that. Great. Do I think it needs to get pushed there really quickly? No, I, I don't. And um, I think if it goes, it's great, again, because I don't want to take people away saying, like, oh, Mark doesn't want us to go to the Olympics. If it goes to the Olympics, this is a great thing, great, whatever. But I think that this industry still needs to figure out what we are a little bit more before we push it so hard to something that we turn – this sport in this industry into something that either it's not ready to be or we try to push it to conform into a box, which it isn't. So 
the X Games seem to have faded away a little bit. I always use the X Games as a good example, and whether it's the X Games or something else gets created, whether it's like a Red Bull thing or what. I think the next step I would like to see is that the sport showcase continue to kind of evolve. Like, we don't even know what this is. Like, you ask somebody what is obstacle course racing or what is obstacle racing, and you're going to get, if you ask 10 people, you're going to get 10 different answers. Like, I think we need to get to a point where we even know what we are before we really try to push it into a box. I mean, are we going to push more towards the stadium side of things? Are we going to push towards the really muddy side of things? Is it a 24-hour race? Is it a, is it a, a you know, is it a, a, a 2K race? We don't know. Can it be all those things? So um, if it goes to the Olympics, great. I just, my fear is that if we push it too hard to go somewhere just to say the sport went to X, like the sport went to the Olympics, what do we lose in the process if we push it too hard? And so I guess, you know, I'd love to see it continue to grow. I'd love to see it continue to um become something that we see on on television or whatnot um what that looks like i still don't know what we'll end up seeing it look looking like and um my hope is that through all of it though that it still remains the essence that is what started this whole thing and made it really cool was that there is a little bit of the unknown and that it continually challenges you in new ways. So I don't know if you can do that and be a standardized sport. So it's kind of a weird, so I guess that's, that's my like an, non-answer answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very political answer. <laughs> no, it really, but it really, like, I really think that this whole industry, we need to figure out hopefully from the inside what we are before we try to present it to the rest of the world. And I really, from speaking with people in other sports as their sport made it towards the Olympics, I don't think us, the easier way to the Olympics, if you want to get to the Olympics, the easiest way to get to the Olympics is to go in underneath somebody, whether that was earlier this year or like in the last couple of years, pentathlon. I know track and field has had some interest in it. Um, gymnastics, FIG, the Federation International, the gymnastics, they've had some interest in it. The problem is, if you go in under that route, which is the easier way to get there, you run the risk of, A, you are now part of a bigger federation, so uh, money doesn't always trickle down. Um, you have no control over where the money goes. So if you're working under FIG, say, <clears throat> you have no control over how much – of the money that comes in through sponsorship deals, TV deals, all that sort of stuff, how much then gets allocated back to your sport itself? Like how much would get allocated back to obstacle racing versus like rhythmic gymnastics, which is under the same federation. So um, there's that. And then, um, then there's also you start to lose, if you're falling under somebody else, you, you can possibly start to lose power over what, the what it is because you're now part of a bigger um a bigger organization so so i mean that's those are those are things to think about and i think um in the pushes towards the olympics i think people need to think about like if we do fall in with somebody else we're going to lose what 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 is the sport going to lose by only having like one person maybe at the table versus having a table of people within the industry so I guess those are my things that um, <clears throat> that make it so that it's like have to consider. And when you talk to more more and more sports, um, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting conversation that we could talk for another two plus hours just about that in general and what it means to try to bring something towards the Olympics. Yeah, the I'm completely against going in under another sport. It's for a lot of the reasons you said, but the, um, what was I going to say? Uh, basically like, I think if you go in on another sport, it kind of, it, you, uh, besides losing a lot of power, like you don't, you're losing name recognition too, right? The, I would argue like if, if we're going in under another sport, we're already in the Olympics. It's called steeplechase, right? You're running, you're jumping over things, you're splashing through water. I'm close enough. The only thing that's missing is, is like a set of monkey bars. And that's, that's quote unquote OCR in the Olympics. Um, 
I will say uh, we've talked about this in the podcast before about the Olympics and essentially, you know, we can talk about how grand and, you know, the great ideals it's under, but at the end of the day, it's a business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, stuff like gymnastics because currently has the position of power. And I think it's also important to remember how much we've grown, like we talked about already earlier on this podcast, you know, from seven, eight years ago into what we are now. And I think, you know, we continue along the current path we're on and, you know, maybe in a couple of years we'll be in the position of power and other other sports will come crawling to us for, um, you know, whatever, trying to leech off our name. So, I don't know. Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, my, my hope too, I guess, with whatever comes in the future is that everybody is that those that have been – I've seen a lot over the years um, – that a lot of people have come into this industry and, and this isn't geared towards any one person because I've seen this <laughs> so many times. I can't even necessarily gear it towards one individual or one person. So please, this is like not pointed at any, any particular person, but um, I've seen over and over again, people coming into this industry from other back or other sports backgrounds or other or other business backgrounds and stuff and they just assume that their background is going to situate them to start to dictate um things within this industry and um you know it can be great sometimes to have an outsider's point of view and it, it can be fantastic and then at the same time it can be really scary to think that if um if certain groups or certain, you know, like we had years ago, somebody was trying to create a U.S. Um, well, we had two different groups trying to create sort of U.S. governing body type things, and um, neither one really came in from within the industry. It was all exterior people coming in thinking that they could um, kind of capitalize on what was happening. And, um, you know, so my hope is that whatever continues to happen, that that – it can grow with those that are in the industry and aren't just trying to, to, I don't know what, what their motives are fully, but that we, that the, that the purpose of what people are in those power positions are there because they want this industry to succeed. I guess that's my biggest thing that I hope is that, is that as we move forward, we have people that really care about the industry and about, how great it is and about all the pieces of it that um, are the ones that will be at the table making those decisions and not people that have come in from the outside that see this as a way to put their stamp on the world or whatever, if that makes sense. <laughs> I agree no, completely. That's and that's what I was like, I don't want, you don't want the outsiders that are coming in for like just the business glory money of it. I mean, we want like, Obviously, like y'all said, it's a it's a business and a sport, but there's a special uniqueness and integrity and weirdness to obstacle course racing that, as we grow, I hope and I think I'll agree that like we want to keep it that weird, unique feeling and like you said, the unknown and certain things. But it's hard to do from like an outsider that really doesn't understand a sport and has never raced and never been on all sides of it. It's hard, so it's like ag agree. We want someone to keep it keep it what it is, but still grow. And that's just the hardest part right there. All right. So good discussion. Let's wrap it up since we've been talking for well over an hour at this point. <laughs> um, Sorry. So no, nah, no worries. I think it was all good stuff. So just kind of, we'll run down, uh, Margaret, any people, company sponsors, et cetera, you want to give a shout out to before we take off? Um, I hope everybody listens to Dirt and Script podcast and check out, I mean, Evan, you write a ton of content for us over at Mud Run Guide as well. So y you write some really, in really great articles. So plug Evan to, um, you know, we've got a lot of content that goes out on that website I schedule it all. I write a ton on it. I think I have almost 700 articles on the website now alone over the last, since I started working there in 2014. So, um, you know, I would say that, that that's about it. I mean, um, just check out if you love obstacle racing. I mean, we literally put out two to three articles a day on the website and they're geared towards everybody. 
some are geared towards the complete beginner. Some are geared towards uh, more advanced racers. It's news. It's race reviews. It's weird op-eds sometimes, but they're awesome. Um, and, and video and stuff like that as well. So uh, total plug for Mudder and Guide right now. And, um, yeah, and and listen to the podcast. My podcast is, like, totally bizarre. Sometimes it's obstacle racing. Sometimes it has absolutely nothing to do with obstacle racing whatsoever. Um, but try to mix it up, keep it interesting, because I think obstacle racing is a catalyst for a lot of things in life. I know it has been for me, and um, I think that it's a way to sort of shake yourself out of out of the 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 dull hum that life can become. So um, so yeah, that's about it. That's all I have. Uh, or you can follow me on I'm all the s- channels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I'm Dirt Your Skirt on um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I have a Pinterest account. I don't use it. Um, but yeah, if you want to get in touch with me, um, you can get to me through any of those channels. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna second your your podcast. I listen to <clears throat> every episode, and even though I don't 100 percent agree with all your guests, <laughs> I do. It's, 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 it's not, this may not sound like a compliment. No, 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 it's fine because right. I bring on controversial guests purposely. So yeah, you, you what, don't have to. What I, really, what I really like it is it expands, uh, it expands my focus, right? So like if I'm always listening to the same people that always agree with me, you're, just get, you're getting confirmation bias, right? You're just getting the same information pushed to you. So I like hearing the other side of, you know, maybe an article I wouldn't necessarily click on or, you know, a website I wouldn't check. But you bring these guests on, you know, that share their insight into anything like training or nutrition or just lifestyle, and it really broadens your horizon. And like I said, I don't agree with all of them, but I, I do appreciate um, the broadening opportunity. Oh, trust so, me. I don't always check it agree out. with my, uh, my guests <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes they say things that I'm like, ooh, well, <laughs> after I, it, brings, cause it, it broadens my horizon too, you know, so so yeah, yeah. Like I don't always agree with them, and I kind of think, you know, like – it's kind of Joe Rogan esque. Like he has a fighter on one week, the next week he has a comedian, and the next week he has on some like totally random person. And yet, you know, I might not listen to them all, but I, you know, I I find something, and I a lot of time get exposed to people that I'm like, oh, well, I would never would have heard about them before. So, so yeah, yeah. And I've got I've got podcasts scheduled through February right now, so we have a variety of guests coming up. Like huge variety I'm, I'm pretty pretty crazy <laughs> that's all i can say right now is they are across the board really diverse <laughs> well i'll just jump in real quick then i was gonna say i'm not gonna do like a specific company or anything but i'll jump on the bandwagon especially since mud run guide i'm assuming this will be out soon with um they've got the best of nominations so 2017 best of ocr nominations for mud run guide so I'll plug both of us here, Strength and Speed Podcast and Dirt and Your Skirt Podcast. Better be nominated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's tons. I think there's 30, 30 different um, categories this year. So um, everything from best metal in the industry to best podcast to best writer to best obstacle race series. So uh, no matter what your role is with this industry, um, there are a lot of options. Um, So I encourage everybody to go nominate and then we go through voting process and then we'll do a live um, Facebook live announcement on the 20th of December. I think it is when um, all the winners will be announced. So we'll make another show out of that like I did last year. That's exciting, and that's what I said it once before, Margaret, when I was on your podcast as a guest, that um, you are literally like an idol to me in the sport and on the media side that I even said, I think, at um, OCRWC, I told you, I was like, if you ever need like an apprentice or someone, (laughs) pick me, pick me, so I'm so glad that we got to have you as a guest, because I don't know how many times you've been a guest on the podcast, but it's pretty awesome to dive into your life and talk to you a bit more and get some more details from you rather than vice versa so thank you for everything coming on and all that you do well thank you guys so i'm honored to have been on the the podcast so i I really appreciate it thank you guys so much cool i'm gonna give a quick final shout out to merrill um we were team merrill this past weekend at world's toughest mutter we came in second place on the team category so obviously really happy about that and i just wrote an article that was released on mudder and guide today although this will be out probably like a week afterwards um, 
talking about military veterans on the podium at World's Toughest Mudder. So I thought it was pretty good. I think most of my articles are pretty good. That's why I write them. <laughs> Obviously, I'm a little biased there. But uh, what's on a side note, what's kind of funny is I think my article that has the best reach and like best traction was one on like it was just something like five random things about that only OCR athletes understand, and it was about like you know pulling mud out of your private parts and all sorts of nonsense. And people loved that one. And I was like, oh man, like. I kind of pulled, you know, I kind of pulled that one out of my butt, and uh, like other ones, I put a lot of work into, you know, like really thinking about deep thoughts behind them, and it's just funny, like that one was the one that got the best traction. But Welcome to the industry today. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess we'll just leave the podcast at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks. Kevin. It's mass appeal. I really appreciate all the all that all the work you do, and I know Brenna just jumped off, but all the work she does, and um, yeah, and and again, thanks so much for having me. All right. Thanks again for being on, Margaret. We'll talk to you later. Bye. <laughs>